Welcome back for part two of basic dysrhythmia interpretation. And we're going to start with this strip right here. And let's go through our steps, regular or irregular. Now, if you tried to measure the intervals between this beat and that beat and that beat, you're going to find that they're irregular. So stop, do not pass go, do not collect $200. For those of you who know Monopoly, the rate's difficult to determine once again because it's not regular. Does it have P waves? Okay, I know you're tempted to say yes, but they do not. Those are not P waves. What you have going on here is atrial fibrillation. In this dysrhythmia, the sinoatrial node is not setting the pace. Or in atrial fib, there are many, many cells that are firing at the same time, causing a quivering in the atria instead of an organized contraction. Atrial fib with a rate of greater than 100 is called under-controlled atrial fib. So this is bad because of what reason? Think about Virchow's triad. Stasis of blood contributes to clot formation, so there's the potential of development of a clot in the atria. If the patient con converts back to a normal rhythm and normal contraction, it is possible that that clot could embolize to the brain, causing a CVA. Atrial fibrillation is usually a symptom of a much larger problem with the heart. It usually relates back to some sort of irritability with the heart muscle. It happens due to atrial dilation from valvular disease, congestive heart failure, excessive adrenergic stimulation, hyperthyroidism, sleep apnea, myocardial infarctions, just to name a few. With atrial fib, you will lose a portion of your cardiac output, which we call the atrial kick. So signs and symptoms are sometimes related back to a decrease of cardiac output. Possible symptoms include weakness, fatigue, lightheadedness, activity intolerance, chest pain, shortness of breath, or palpitations. Atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter are often categorized together. Atrial flutter can degrade into atrial fibrillation. While you do not need to know atrial flutter for this course, they are treated the same way. So as you can see here, this is atrial fibrillation and you have an uneven, irregular rhythm with no P waves. And then atrial flutter, you have this beautiful sawtooth pattern. Okay, it still can be irregular and oftentimes this can degrade into this and treatment is often the same, same way. Now on to the fun stuff. It may be because where I spend my time and which populations I care for, but atrial fib is fairly common. Diagnostically, what is the best test that you can use to see if a patient is in atrial fibrillation? I'll let you think for a second. If you guessed a 12 lead EKG, you would be correct, because a 12 lead EKG is the best thing you can do to see if a person's in atrial fib. Other things are listening to heart sounds. You would have an irregular S1 and S2. That's a big clue that your patient is in atrial fib. An echocardiogram can show an abnormal wall function of the heart muscle. Okay, so the diagnostics are fairly, fairly simple. Pharmacology, it's all about time frames and heart rate. And there's a algorithm on the following page that's going to kind of delineate it out. You have a two-pronged approach to a new case of atrial fibrillation. Antidysrhythmics and anticoagulants. Most antidysrhythmic drugs target the sodium, potassium, and or calcium channels involved with transmission of electrical impulses. For heart rates greater than 100, the patient may receive IV diltiazem, which is a calcium channel blocker. It will decrease cardiac conduction, but you have to be careful because it will also vasodilate as it relaxes smooth muscle. So you have to watch blood pressures on patients with IV diltiazem. Amiodarone is the current drug of choice for patients who have a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. It works on the sodium, potassium, and calcium channels. Along with this is anticoagulant therapy, most commonly heparin or anoxaparin. Atrial fibrillation may convert back to normal sinus rhythm on its own or with drug therapy. If not, cardioversion is an option. Stay tuned with me for a few slides. All right, so this looks like a hot mess, and maybe it is, but it's an algorithm describing how treatment of atrial fibrillation is structured. As you can see, heart rate is important, as is the period of time the patient has been in atrial fibrillation. 
So you start up here with atrial fib diagnosed by 12 lead EKG. If the rate is fast, they may put the patient on IV diltiazem for rate control. If the rate is slower, they may start loading on an antidysrhythmic of amiodarone. I would like to point out that either way, patients will have amiodarone. Even if they're on IV diltiazem, they'll probably also place them on a loading dose of amiodarone. Important to think and remember about amiodarone is that other than being an antidysrhythmic and working in the calcium, sodium, and potassium channels is that it has a risk of lung problems in the form of pulmonary fibrosis and you have to watch liver. So you've got your antidysrhythmic started. Then they most likely will put a patient on heparin or Lovenox. If they don't know how long the patient has been in atrial fib or has been at least three days, okay, they're going to send the patient down for transesophageal echocardiogram, also known as a TEE. And what they're looking for there is a clot in the left atrial appendage. If there is a clot, they just bought themselves anticoagulant therapy for three to six weeks and then back around to come back in and evaluate whether or not the clot is still there. Sometimes patients will convert on their own during that time. If there is no clot on TEE, they can progress to synchronized cardioversion. Going back up here, if it's a witnessed or a known period of time and the patient has been on heparin and Lovenox for the period of time, they may progress directly to a synchronized cardioversion. Just to give you an idea, so it's important to know about time frames when you're thinking about atrial fibrillation. This slide contains the visual pictures of a TEE procedure. The patient is placed under conscious sedation and an ultrasound probe is placed down the esophagus. This allows for an unobstructed view of the chambers of the heart. On the right side of the picture is a picture of a clot in the left atrial appendage. So if you can imagine that this whole thing here is the left atrium, then this solid piece of white here is a clot. Once again, here is your left atrial appendage, and there's a nice pretty little clot. It's so just not pretty for the patient. That's a common sight for occurrence of clots, is the left atrial appendage. It's important to know the differences between cardioversion and defibrillation. With cardioversion, the patient has a pulse and a blood pressure. Okay. The principle behind cardioversion is applying a shock time to the R wave in order to allow for the heart's electrical system to reset. So, cardioversion is generally an elective procedure, so the patient is aware of what's going to be happening. And it cracks me up that this says the client is way awake. Uh, I guarantee you, if you come at the patient with a bunch of paddles and electrical stimulus, they're not going to let you do it. So the client is, I would say, even more than frequently is almost always sedated. It, it is synchronized. So when you do a cardioversion, you need to make sure that the button on the, def on the defibrillator that says sync has been pushed. Generally, it's a lower energy level of 50 to 200 joules, and it's something you would expect the patient to have signed a consent for. Defibrillation, okay, it's an emergency and the patient does not have a pulse. Okay, so defibrillation, it does not matter if there's a QRS complex. We're just going to apply energy at whatever point we push the buttons. There is no cardiac output. Generally, you start with 200 joules and go up to 360. The client is unconscious in that they do not have a pulse. So just to know the difference, you do not want to defibrillate somebody who has a pulse. More often than not, you will create a situation where they no longer have that pulse. So remember the sync button. The following slides on this PowerPoint are added for you to practice with interpretation of basic rhythm strips. Have fun and good luck with your interpretation.